Good afternoon, students, and welcome to ADW 112. This is the module on Garveyism, Diaspora, and Africa. So the concept of Pan-Africanism is one of our terms of engagement. So we want to keep in mind this idea of Pan-Africanism. A few tenets of Pan-Africanism are African people, Black folks, all over the world face common problems. Africans should seek a common solution to these common problems. Dignity and respect for people of African descent can be won through political and economic power and cultural contributions. Some early um, icons who might be considered Pan-Africanists are individuals such as Paul Cuffey, was a wealthy Quaker and ship owner, first major American born Pan-African. Pan -African. The American Colonization Society has some interesting history. Uh, there is a racist history to the American Colonization Society that includes many presidents, um, founding fathers who advocated for this idea that Africans or black folks and white folks could not live together and the best thing to do post-emancipation was to send formerly enslaved Africans back to Africa. The area that they chose was Liberia. Liberia obviously had folks who were already settled there, and that caused a little bit of a little bit of um, conflict, to to say the least. Another early Pan-Africanist is Edward Wilmot Blyden. He's the most important predecessor of Garvey, um, one of the earliest, if you will, theoricians of Pan-Africanism. Alexander Crummel, another early Pan-Africanist, a patriot and educator. Martin Delaney, a patriot, a scholar. Our policy must be Africa for the African race and Black men to rule them. We'll see this idea that Martin Delaney introduces are uh, repeated by Garvey. 1887, Kansas Africa Immigration Society. Um, if you're interested in that concept, go ahead and think about it a little bit, Google it and come back and let's talk about why did they fail. Bishop Henry McNeil Turner is also a early predecessor to Garvey. No race will ever be respected or ought to be respected who do not show themselves capable of founding and manning a government of their own creation. There were a couple Pan-Africanist Congress meetings in your reading, talked about one of them. There were uh, 1900, 1919, 1921, 1923, and 1927, and 1945. So you can also think about what were those weaknesses of all of those conferences? And in the introduction, the reading that you have to read, um, the scholar talks about some of the problems of the 1945 Pan-African Congress meeting and how some of those goals uh, certainly had not been met. So let's talk a bit about Marcus Garvey. His early life, he was born in St. Anne's Bay, Jamaica in 1887. He formed a group there called Garvey's Watchmen in 1910. He began to travel. He traveled to Europe, England, where he studied. And there he was influenced by Booker T. Washington, who is um, wrote up from slavery, a early African-American educator, activist, and scholar. And Booker T. Washington's work uh, influenced Garvey to move to a Pan-Africanist vision. His organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities Leagues were first established in 1914. Um, there's a video, I've also linked this video in the course that talks about the influences of Marcus Garvey. All right, what were the goals of the UNIA and ACL? First, building brotherhood, camaraderie amongst Black folks, promoting racial pride, 
serving as an advocate for Black folks globally and promoting commerce. The economic piece can be directly traced back to Booker T. Washington. In 1916, moved to Harlem. Think about why he moved to Harlem. The text references that. 1918, first branch of the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. And there, once in Harlem, once in New York, he moved to Harlem. Harlem is, is known for the Harlem Rene Renaissance, a large population of um, Americans of African descent. So these are a couple of businesses that Garvey and organizations that Garvey started. The Negro Factories Corporation, made black dolls, the Negro world, which was the newspaper at the time, the Black Star Line, which was the cruise line that got the most attention, the African Legion and Black Cross nurses. So Garveyism is considered the largest black mass movement ever. There's not um, anything really comparative to it since. There was 725 branches in the U.S. between 1925 to 1928, 271 branches outside of the U.S. from 1925 to 1928, boasted, boasted membership of a million within the third year. There's a speech that you can listen to, and I've also linked this speech in the course. All right. How did the UNIA and the ACL get so large? First, the newspaper, the Negro world. It was national. It talked about issues of import to folks of African descent throughout Africa and the diaspora. Obviously, um, there was a literary section, which wasn't just the news, so essays, poetry as well, and editorials. So from roughly 1918 to 1925, the Negro World and some of these other organizations were at their height. Um, also, there was an International Convention of Negro Peoples of the World founded by the UNIA that um, brought in so many people throughout the diaspora that in some ways was more successful than earlier iterations of the Pan-Africanist Congress. The red, black, and green flag that we often associate with um, Africa was first articulated or designed by Garvey. Later, several African nations adopted this. One of this, one of them was Ghana. Kwame Nkrumah was influenced by Garvey's work. The Black Star Line was a cruise line that was just full of problems, um, probably which led to Garvey's downfall. It definitely put him and his um, group in the sights of J. Edgar Hoover, who was the FBI's chief at that point. Uh, the Negro Factories Corporation, which created the dolls, actually was probably a bit more uh, well-run than the Black Star Line. So there are three reasons for Garvey's success. His personal traits, timing. Um, he came into the public limelight at a time where folks were really looking for this, this kind of leader. And as I mentioned before, there had already been folks who sort of laid out this ideology. I spoke of Delaney, for example, Cuffey. Um, so these ideas about race first, Africa for the Africans, self-reliance, nationhood, pan-Africanism, and pan-Africanism just means that any African in the continent of Africa and throughout the diaspora, and, and there are multiple diasporas, you might remember in 111, we talked about the various movements and migrations of African people, but the current diaspora um, Garvey was referring to. So folks who have been colonized, folks who have been um, enslaved and were dispersed throughout the West. All right. So literary Garveyism set the trend of celebrating black culture for other Harlem writers to follow. So remember we talked about the Harlem world and that particular section of it where there was poetry. So he established this notion of pro-Black literature and literary criticism. So a genre of literature and then folks who could come along and kind of analyze it and dissect and discuss it. Um, 
this was a little bit more mass masses based and black control than the Harlem Renaissance, which was financed by white patrons. So we know some of the, the main folks of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, many of the people who supported and elevated these black voices during what we call the Harlem Renaissance were white folks. This, however, was promoted and advocated by Black people. This preceded the Harlem Renaissance by about five years. So we could also argue, and many do, that um, Garvey's work, this pro-Black literature, literary Garvey, Garveyism informed the Harlem Renaissance. All right, Garvey had a tremendous cultural impact in the 1920s, especially in America and the Caribbean. Garvey inspired a literary movement that was prior to the Harlem Renaissance, as I mentioned, and was far more broad-based. So it also included Caribbean writers, idea, notions and ideas about Caribbean writers, um, and in some ways, the actual continent of Africa, where if we look at the Harlem Renaissance, it was really kind of focused on the quote-unquote Negro in America. Begin, and not in all cases, but generally. Beginning in 1920, Many UNI members and other nationalists achieved voice by writing for Garvey's Negro World. Some of those writers include some folks who might be familiar to you. Marcus Garvey, of course, Amy Jacques Garvey, um, who was his second wife. He was married to a previous Amy. This is the second Amy. Hubert Harrison, William H. Ferris, Elaine Locke, um, T. Thomas Fortunes, or Neil Hurston, Arthur Schomburg, Duse Muhammad Ali. All right, so what was Garvey's influence, his impact on the world? So he promoted and pushed race first, this idea of Africa for the Africans. Look for me in the world when this black liberation flag, that there was a unified black identity for folks who were of African descent. And that because we share not just a skin color, but we share an identity, we share a history, we share an experience of colonialism, um, enslavement, we should all, despite the vast differences in language, culture, geopolitical location, that all people of African descent, all Black folks of African descent um, should align themselves for, you know, obviously political and economic um, reasons. Garvey um, also, we mentioned previously, shaped the Harlem Renaissance, which is the idea of pro-Black literature in general can be attributed to Marcus Garvey. Um, the civil rights movement in general, Black nationalism and cultural nationalism. So Black nationalism is the idea that Black folks should have some modicum of nationhood. Modicum is probably not even the right word, but there should be a Black nation led by Black people for Black people. Well, the civil rights movement more so agitated for civil rights to be fully included into the current American system where Black nationalists um, might argue that um, some might be considered separatist and desiring a nation for led by Black folk. Cultural nationalism, um, it depends on who you're asking, but generally it's this idea that we come from Africa, particularly West Africa, and there are languages and practices from this area. There are clothing, um, styles, hairstyles from this, this area that we should embrace. And an idea of that cultural Black nationalism was Black folks don't really have a culture in America, which is not, I would disagree with, but just kind of giving you a really quick lowdown of cultural Black nationalism, that um, what is considered culture for Black people in America is so informed by Europe, Europeans, white supremacy. And a lot of that sort of beat down our self-esteem, our perception of who we are as Black people. So cultural Black nationalists argue that we need to reclaim a history before colonization, before enslavement and take pride in that. So cultural black nationalists um, bought in daishikis and afros and um, wearing Africa pendants and learning uh, Kiswahili, adapting Kwanzaa. We can kind of point that to 
to cultural nationalists. And sometimes these, these lines, these, these differences between civil rights advocates, black nationalists and cultural nationalists are, are kind of um, unclear. They overlap quite a bit. Malcolm X's parents were Garveyites. So Mark, Malcolm X, as we may or may not know, it would be uh, considered a black nationalist. So the Nation of Islam would be a kind of categorized as a black nationalist movement. So as a Garveyite or follower of Garvey, his parents being Garveyites, black nationalism obviously would have appealed to Malcolm X and his siblings, all of whom, not all of them, but many of whom uh, converted to Islam and followed the Nation of Islam. There are also various African liberation movements, uh, some of which we have talked about, some of which we will continue to talk about. So throughout the continent, uh, uh, people of African descent or people who are African in Africa were agitating for liberation from their oppressors. So um, John Henry Clark talks a bit about the legacy of Marcus Garvey. I've linked this video in the course. And if you go to about um, Mark 17, this is where we start to hear the discussion about Marcus Garvey's legacy. Here are some of the words of Marcus Garvey that I would like to share with you. Um, look for me in the whirlwind or the storm. Look for me all around you for with God's grace, I shall come and bring with me countless millions of black slaves who have died in America and the West Indies and the millions in Africa to aid you in the fight for liberty, freedom and life. All I have, I have given to you. I have sacrificed my home and my loving wife for you. I entrust her to your charge to protect and defend her in my absence. After my enemies are satisfied in life or death, I shall come back to you to serve even as I have served before. In life, I shall be the same. In death, I shall be a terror to the foes of Negro liberty. If death has power, then count me in death to be the real Marcus Garvey I would like to be. If I may come in an earthquake or a cyclone or plague or pestilence or as God would have me, then be assured that I shall never desert you and make your enemies triumph over you. Would I not go to hell a million times for you? Would I not like Macbeth's ghost walk the earth forever for you? Would I not lose the whole world and eternity for you? Would I not cry forever before the footstools of the Lord omnipotent for you? Would I not die mean deaths for you? Then why be sad? Cheer up and be assured that if, that if it takes a million years, the sins of our enemies shall visit the millionth generation of these that hinder and oppress us. First message to the Negroes of the world from Atlanta prison by Marcus Garvey, the Negro world, 10th of February, 1925. This is significant because if you remember, Marcus Garvey at this point, when he wrote this was ill, um, pneumonia and the guards, and obviously his, his followers were concerned whether he would live or die. Um, if we remember in the reading, Shortly after, around this time, Marcus Garvey, he wasn't quite pardoned, but he was released early um, and by the governor. And the reason for that is because they didn't want Marcus Garvey to become a martyr for the movement, which would obviously, uh, in, in their opinion, aggravate uh, Black folks in the same way, for example, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King's assassination caused um, quite a bit of civil unrest, quite a bit of um, marching, protesting, uh, requests for change. A lot of times they're, they're named riots, but agitation for liberty and, and what they were afraid of because they're even before the famous folks we do know, there were multiple um, uprisings by um, Black Americans um, as a result of various kinds of experiences and oppression. We don't know about a lot of them um, if we just kind of went through regular educational systems, but there are quite a few. So Edgar Hoover had good reason to be concerned that if Marcus Garvey died in jail, that people would be pretty upset. So here are a few key terms you want to sort of keep in mind. Nationalism, 
involves a strong identification of a group of individuals with a political entity defined in national terms, i.e. a nation. Often it is believed that an ethnic group has the right to statehood or that citizenship in a state should be limited to one ethnic group or that multinationality in a single state should necessarily comprise the right to express and exercise national identity even by minorities. So we live in a multinational state or multi-ethnic state. Um, so there are different notions of what black nationalism looks. So I, I mentioned this idea of, of separatism. So have your own couple states, but there's also a nation within a nation that um, African people should be able to express their national identity even within a larger nation. So nationalism um, can be problematic um, as we've seen in the world, but there also can be some benefits to it. This this idea that people should be able to be self-determinant, but ethnostates can be, can be problematic. Cultural nationalism is a form of nationalism in which the nation is defined by a shared inherited culture as opposed to, for instance, its ethnicity or its institution. So I spoke a little earlier about cultural nationalism and some of the key characteristics of it. Pan-Africanism is a social political worldview, philosophy and movement which seeks to unify native Africans and those of African heritage into a global African community. The term Pan-Africanism is sometimes also used for the advocacy of political African unification. So, so social political worldview, philosophy and a movement, and also a term to make sense of political unification of the continent of Africa. So there are multiple countries, multiple dialects, multiple language, multiple peoples in Africa. Pan-Africanism also talks about how um, all of these groups can, can unify. So this is Baba Ajie Okoto's definition of nation building. The conscious and focused application of our people's collective resources, energies, and knowledge to the task of liberating and developing the psyche and physical space that we identify as ours. Nation building involves the development of behaviors, values, language, and physical structures that reflect African history and culture, creating a new reality, renewed national and cultural consciousness. Thank you.